Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Pokemon Go's podcast and April Fools. This is actually just a completely normal Utano analysis, but it's not a Pokemon analysis, hence the April Fools. What do you mean? We're totally doing Pokemon. Utano catches Pokemon. Don't you don't you know Choo Choo? Choo Choo. That's that's a Pokemon. I wipe Choo Choo from my memory. <laughs> <laughs> now that's mean. You're not allowed to do that. I think you're required to do that. <laughs> no, Choo Choo is a canonically important character. He's necessary, you know? How else are Utena and Anthe going to get their bodies switched back in that filler chapter that might probably not even be canon? I mean, it's in the show as well, so... Oh, it was? Yeah, it was. Whoa. It's 100% necessary. I think I also have one or two notes about him, like, actually being important, because he does yeah. one or two things. He's actually good. He's actually a cool boy. Anyway, Utena is the cool show from... Ikuhara, but we're not doing the show because we're the Pokemangos podcast. And we're not doing Pokemon either. We're just doing Udena. I've already so, seen the show. I, I made this podcast to force myself to read manga I haven't read before. Yeah, I think it's important to note that, yeah, we've both seen the show before reading it. So I think it's. Bo- I don't know about you, but uh, it's been a long while since I've actually seen the show, and I've only seen the show once. Yeah, same. So, like, I, I know. Or at least remember a lot of what happens in the show proper. But I feel like I don't have a full grasp because it's been so long since I've watched it. And also I just feel like if I watched it now, I would get way more out of it than when I originally watched it. I I feel very similarly. So the start of this manga is really weird because you have Utena going to not Otori, making Otori a lot less metaphorical when you get to it. But also, she's just going to a normal school, and you see she has an aunt, which she has a parental figure now, which makes a lot of Otori Academy even more questionable as not being a metaphor. And she also has a friend who she completely dumps forever and never talks to again after this. It's kind of like, she's she's kind of coming from a place of normalcy, but you know, she's going to be catapulted to the exact opposite of that, so it kind of grounds it in a more reality, but... Something about this manga makes it a lot more grounded in reality and literal compared to the anime where nothing is. I mean, I think I remember a part at the end where the author says like, oh, I kind of meant it just as like a normal high school thing, but then it turned into, whoa, it's Utena. It's it's completely metaphorical now. You have Kaito, and he is very questioning which is probably why he got removed very quickly before you get to Atori. Because if you have someone like him questioning everything about Utena, it's just going to be text filled with him questioning everything about Utena. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's the guy who like really cares about her and like wants to know everything that's going on. But he's trying to do the best for her. He does it in like a sympathetic way. He does feel like he's looking out for her, but he also feels like he has a bit of an ego in trying to be having his opinions proven right. And you get sort of a balance of him caring about Utena, but also caring about being right. Yeah, which definitely makes it a bit interesting, but we don't get it for long enough to develop it into anything meaningful. Ironically, he, like Abraxas, the god of paradoxes and duality of opposites, we'll see a lot in Utena, especially the manga, surprisingly, compared to the anime. You have Kaito being both correct and incorrect about the prince, because the prince as a person ends up being a real person. However, the ideals of the prince and everything Utena sees in the prince, in a lot of ways, is a complete lie, and he's completely right that that prince does not exist as Utena thinks it exists. Yeah, that's for sure. He definitely, like, oh, it's n- that actually some cool hints where it's like, oh, it's not real, it's fake, it's, like, not what you think it is, but, yeah, we'll get to that. I remember reading it and just being like, Utena, the prince is a lie. Don't trust Akio. Don't do it. It doesn't lead to anything good. <laughs> I mean, the anime does that as well. No, not the anime, the manga. The manga does this as well, but she doesn't listen. They both do it, and it both ends up terribly, 
She should have listened to Kaito. Kaito was correct all along. Don't trust the prince. The prince is a lie. The cake is a lie. Dated memes. Dated memes indeed. Now, Kaito's also cool because he kind of is. He could be an Utena. If he had his own story and he had some other guy there, he could just be a gay Utena. He, that could work. I, I definitely think so. In the first chapter, we have Utena. She, you know, she doesn't care about the rules. She does what she wants. And Kaido is all being, oh, you know, people shouldn't perv on Udena. And, you know, you should take the proper route. You shouldn't go do, you shouldn't have different clothes and stuff. But in the second chapter, Kaido, he, he does all that stuff. He breaks all the rules to find out, oh, is Udena getting letters from weird guys on the internet stalking her? No, not quite, but um, the parallel. It would be if it was made today. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. If it was made today, it'd be, yeah, he's looking up guys on the internet. He's tracking their IPs, but there's this one really cool thing I want to say, because you know how they, she gets the rose, the gift of roses? There's this one part where it goes like, oh, the roots, they look like a blue rose. And you know, if you've seen Twin Peaks, <laughs> the movie, <laughs> you know, blue roses don't exist. They're fake. But yeah, because there's a thing where Ikahara is like a Lynch fan. That's never been confirmed. That's just a theory. I yeah, have. just the theory. It's just a dumb theory. <laughs> well, not dumb theory. So I'm saying that, but it's just a theory, a game theory. But yeah, um, I mean, you have both Persona and Link's Awakening, and yeah. I haven't actually looked into seeing if Ikuhara has ever said anything about anything David Lynch has done. But considering how big Twin Peaks was in Japan. And it's Ikuhara, I do feel like there's a good chance of him seeing something David Lynch has done in his life. Probably. That is some really interesting foreshadowing, though, that I did not know about. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of not, but it kind of is. Because the Blue Rose is from, like, the fake Prince guy, which we haven't talked about yet. But actually, yeah, let's go into that now. So she gets the letter from, ooh, it's a spooky guy. It's It's my love, my love of my life, who's protect me who protect me from the evil he tells her oh keep your nobility she doesn't really know what the word nobility is but she understands the concept she has the cultural relevancy general idea in her mind of what it means yeah but she still has to figure out what it truly means for herself to keep her nobility yeah and that's really what the manga especially is about that idea of her figuring out what her nobility means and how she intends to keep herself noble, mm. which gets more deconstructed in the anime, but it's played a lot more straightforward in the manga. I kind of like it like that. Like, it's very direct about what it wants to do. I've said this before, but it's very, this relates to this and that relates to that. Do you have much to add on this like pre Yotori Academy part because we might like try to skip most of that really. I thought I'd spend the most time on that actually but I think I'm actually done with everything I could say. Because there are a few things. The aunt. The aunt is actually caught kissing the guy who she thinks is the prince and that's like a really awkward moment for everyone and the aunt acts like exactly like Utena does when she's embarrassed. They're always drawn like without their mouth really red blushing on their face even though it's a manga and there's i can't see the red yeah yeah it's it's really cutely drawn every time someone's embarrassed or like frustrated when utina friend zones him and she licks his face because they're they're best friends i do want to take a detour to talk about color designs how chiho saito imagined when she was inking the color spreads for the covers and for some of the interior pages she imagined Utena's outfit being pink and her hair being blonde. Basically, Ikuhara came in and was like, Hey, we just changed your entire design and didn't get your input at all. When they were deciding to choose between red and black, they asked her and she said, I think they should change her outfit to red if you're not going to keep it pink at all. So they just changed it to bluish black. Yeah, Ikuhara was like, yeah, you know. I thought this, so we're going to do this. But as it pertains to the manga, it's actually interesting because when they're shading in her uniform, for most of the manga, it's 
shaded as being like a light gray, but there's that period in the middle when Utena starts wearing a normal uniform and gets out of her old male shaped uniform. And after those periods when her she gets her uniform back, suddenly it's the darker shaded uniform that's closer to the anime. While it's in black and white, you can definitely tell for the rest of the chapters that it is a much darker shaded in color for her outfit. So what really seems like going on is for the early part of the manga, she is wearing her pink uniform, but when she swaps between those mid-chapters, she just gets her anime uniform. Because <laughs> she's anime now. Yeah, did it like magically transform, or was it just a different uniform? Actually, no, it was just a different uniform, wasn't it? <laughs> I think the implication is she had her pink uniform in like the early manga covers and stuff and she's just switching to her the color they used for the anime. Yeah. But I am pretty sure in the early covers you have Utena having a pink uniform and most of the manga she has a uniform that is colored in with a gray, a very light gray, how you would if you were doing like a pink uniform. However, there's a period where she has a fight with Anthe and she loses Anthe in one of the duels. After she loses to Toga, she starts wearing a normal student uniform instead of her classic uniform, and when she gets out of that slump and goes back to her break in the rules uniform, the color shading used for her outfit is much darker, so the implication is that in the early chapters, Shiho Saito was a rebel and made it canonical so she had her pink outfit. She just simply changed outfits to her anime outfit halfway through the manga, but also what makes her outfit change from pink to the darker color, which it's all in black and white, but the implication is still there so I, I'm pretty sure it actually happens is she has a new resolve to fight and I think it actually fits the themes a bit more that when she goes from her old uniform to a normal uniform back to a boyish uniform she chooses a more masculine color or at least societally seen as masculine color from going from pink to more of a black yeah because she's no girl she is a prince which is actually a decent segue to the next part of the manga where she literally talks about i'd rather be a prince than a princess because princesses get saved and princes do the saving it's a gender role thing and there's all sorts of stuff at the start of the chapter where it's like oh it's a waste for her to be a girl you know she's so hot as a man where even the girls are looting her the gender role of a man is being imposed on her by herself and also the others around her. Like, just that in itself is an interesting thing. That it's not just her, it's actually the people around her as well. Like, even Wak Wakaba, like her best friend character, is all over her, jumping on her all the time. You know, to definitely 100% in love. It's interesting how that does form her identity, and to go back to what I was talking about earlier where there's that section where she stops wearing that uniform, Wakaba is actually super disappointed and views it as Utena betraying herself rather than it just being a fashion choice, so it really shows how the society of the academy views general fashion as a part of who you are. Her whole dynamic in the school has changed just because what clothes she's wear she wears, so yeah. It's a really interesting thing in that chapter. The nobility and justice, like justice is also part of that nobility concept. We get one of our first scenes of Seonji, you know, he's abusing Anthe and giving her the old slap. We, we see many slaps throughout the manga. <laughs> and as I've said to Ray many times, if it's a slap, it's a Gundam. Something I feel like happens in a lot of these is you actually see bystanders just sort of looking and then looking away, and it shows how ignoring a flaw in a system just causes the cycle to repeat. Whoa. <laughs> or causes the cycle to revolve in the case of Utena. And we actually see Toga stopping this abuse, and it's like, oh, Toga is the justice man. He he does the justice. Is he the prince, maybe? This is the first time we get, hmm, he's a, you know, he's kind of like that prince guy. Maybe it's him, which is interesting. There's this really interesting sort of back and forth with Toga on his morality, where one moment he'll do something positive, and then he'll do something negative, and then he'll do something that seems positive and then is actually negative, or vice versa. So you have this really, I would say, 
he definitely lands more on the negative side as it goes on. But once again, you have that sort of a praxis of having opposing ideas in the same character. He kind of lands as a proto Akio To an extent. Yeah, to an extent. Yeah, that, that's particularly the thing. He stops at some point. He doesn't go to either extreme of the idea of the prince who did... He doesn't go to the extreme of the prince who, on the one hand, he was so selfless that he burnt himself out trying to help everybody, but also his negatives definitely don't go anywhere near the child predator that is Akio. We we also get a thing that Wakaba likes, you know, aggressive boys like Seonji, you know? She likes those manly types, which is... And then you see, like, oh, she likes Utena, and it's conflating those two. While we do see her being into, quote-unquote, aggressive people, I don't think aggressive is what she's into. Rather, it's more being able to stick up for yourself, which is something you see a lot in how she loves Utena. And it's made unclear if this is a romantic love or not, which is played for jokes, but still actually mentioned in there that there might be some, even if comedic, romantic feelings toward Utena. So you see her, I wouldn't call Utena at all aggressive, but I would say she definitely is someone who can stick up for herself, and I think that's what she finds attractive. Yeah. Well, I was just going on, like, these are the quote-unquote more masculine, yeah. like, stereotypes her, are rolling her into that gender kind of thing. For how stereotypical a lot of Vittori Academy's general societal norms seem to be. Mm. It might be just because it is from Japan, but it's actually surprising how popular they made Miki, who's a lot more timid, who normally in these types of stories would seem to be quote-unquote popular, but like people wouldn't realize that people want to be around him. Okay. Whereas they would make a more big deal out of, say, what's the guy name? Red hair. <laughs> Toga. <laughs> Where you'd see someone like Toga being popular and surrounded by girls, I don't think a lot of this type of media would have Miki also being surrounded by girls, because he's more of a timid, smart, sort of piano boy. Yeah, he would be. Whereas here, no, he is just a chick magnet. <laughs> or he would be if it wasn't for his twin sister, <laughs> blocking out all the magnetism. <laughs> But yeah, I was about to say, this is where I can touch on, actually touch on Onisama Air, because in that show, like, half the characters are, like, just not even androgenized, but just masculinized to such an extent where they are basically, like, multiple times confused for male characters, and that they're actually quite popular. There's a lot of similarities there, but I definitely think that maybe it's a Japan thing, Maybe it's just that he's pulling from, like, these Dazaki-directed shows, but there's a lot of that kind of stuff going on there. I think a lot of it is also sort of... Ikuhara seems to be a very countercultural person, and there are pictures of him back then, for example, cosplaying Sailor Moon characters, so I think he's the type of person who would find this sort of thing cool. He didn't just cosplay Sailor Moon, but he also directed Sailor Moon S and Supers, which are probably the two most gay Sailor Moon seasons, aside from the third arc in Crystal, but that didn't come until like 20 years later. <laughs> well, um, not really analytical here, but there's like, the first time is I see it, like, and like the only time I see it, but you know in the anime when they go like, oh, I know something, I know something, and those, like, the shadows, yeah... There's one that appears in, in the chapter 5 there. It's actually, and you don't see it ever again, but it's kind of cool. The shadow dramas. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's not something major or anything, but. But I remember keeping an eye out for it, but clearly I didn't keep an eye out for it enough. It's a cool feature, and like, it was actually used, and it's like this tiny thing that's used, which is cool. It self analyzes itself, you know. And it ends up actually being a fairly major part of the anime, all things considered. There's a part where Toga's talking about Anthe being treated harshly, and it's like, oh, it's not our decision, you know? It's like, Seonji's right to say, you know, how he gets to treat her, because, you know, that's what he he owns her. <laughs> and there's all this, this thing about, oh, Seonji, like, 
symbolizes this kind of relationship is that oh the man you know can say whatever he wants until says someone who can win women's rights men can do anything they want I think it's also a type of thing where they don't want to bother the couple because what is their relationship aside from their business, which is obviously a bad mindset when you have someone like Sionji being very abusive. <laughs> Maybe slavery is bad. Maybe having ownership of other people is not good. Yeah, you're white American. <laughs> um, but yeah. In this chapter, and that like that part alone, it was me thinking of like, oh, because it goes like, oh, until there's someone who can win her heart and like, you know, use the power to revolutionize the world. It was like a very, oh, you win her heart, you win women's rights, and you revolutionize the world by removing this injustice of, you know, <laughs> of stopping people from being slaves and being like, you know, like not actual people in relationships. Sayonji is like, it's not, he's not even doing it because he just feels his superior. He's just like, it's fun to make other people hurt, you know? It's ha ha funny. He goes through that like in the next chapter after. And. Which is kind of ironic because at the start, he seems to be doing this all out of entertainment, but as it goes on, he slowly becomes obsessed with Anthe. Well, maybe not slowly, but quickly devolves into complete despair over not having this person in his life when just a minute ago he only viewed her as a plaything to abuse. Then we move on to like the big boy castle, the really cool castle in the sky, Ghibli reference. In the Utena anime, there'd be a sequence of Utena grabbing the door handle, the drop would hit the ring, she'd walk up the stairs, and it's all aesthetic. However, in the manga, when she grabs the door handle, a mechanism goes over her hand, detects the ring, and then opens back up, which seems like a lot more of a realistic way to handle that. Of just a computer scanning the ring or something like that. It's not fully explained. But it also is a lot less cool than a little droplet hit in the ring. And the doors burst open. However, it's also, like I said earlier, and will keep saying, it's a lot more literal, and it's a lot more grounded, and in that way I feel like certain people would like the manga more than the anime, because a lot of it is just focused on being a being a plot over a metaphor. And after the gates open, you have Utena walking up the stairs, and something you don't get in the anime that completely changes the tone is Utena's internal monologue as she walks up the stairs. In the anime, she doesn't seem to really have many secondary thoughts, she's just really determined to go up the stairs and fight some people, while in the manga, she's questioning all the weird stuff goes later on like oh mickey is the only sane person around here because he doesn't want to duel <laughs> he doesn't like these mickey weird being ideas. a part of that just goes to show that people participate in social systems on different levels so while mickey is participating much less than the others he's still perpetuating that culture i want to say cult but <laughs> it kind of is but yeah he's not active in the situation and then they go about this way of, oh, Seonji has the right to do what he wants because, you know, he owns the Rose Bride and the power to revolutionize the world, the Sword of Dios, he pulls it from Anthe's heart. So Anthe's heart is the power to revolutionize the world. If you have her heart, you will revolutionize the world. I feel like it's already going like, you know, whoever Anthe loves will have this power. I probably wouldn't have picked that up if I hadn't seen the show already. I feel like it's a very direct metaphor to like what happens later in the show, in the manga and the show. She has to duel. So to earn her heart, Utna beats him up with a stick, <laughs> like a fool. Um, but yeah, she she du 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 duels. I think we can all agree that Utena is by far the most well-developed female duelist. Have you? The guy involved with the most Yu-Gi-Oh! shows has basically said that he doesn't know how to write female characters, so he writes them out of the show as early as possible. That's why the first 50 episodes of Yu-Gi-Oh! 5Ds is, like, great. But then they shift who's working on it, and then suddenly Akiza, who's like the best character in the show, just gets completely sidelined because she's a girl. Well, no. <laughs> Imagine if girls were human. I feel like there's a lot of Akiza jokes to be made about her being 
the Black Rose Duelist. All jokes I would not understand. Well, you see, all of her cards are, like, plant-based, and she uses mostly black roses as her motif, and both both in her deck and her general aesthetic. And, you know, black rose, like the Utana thing, and the duelist, like an Utana. <laughs> it's like it's a ripoff. <laughs> We actually hadn't gone into it before, but um, it's important to note that White Rose is the scent she smelled from the opening of the letter, and it symbolizes her prince and the ideals of justice and nobility. She smells it on Anthe, she has a White Rose when she duels. That's kind of a little bit important, but we haven't directly talked about it. Also, the fact that at the start, she comes to defend Wakaba's honor, because Oh, we also didn't dis- describe this, but she has a love letter displayed and Seonji doesn't care about it. It's to Seonji from Wakaba because he's a strong, masculine man and he doesn't care and he shames her for it. Utena's defending her honor because she's a justice person. She is a noble. Also, piercing white roses sounds very much like taking virginity. That's just too similar a concept to ignore, I felt. We kind of skipped over the fight a little bit, and I just remembered something, one of the first major realizations I had about this manga that made it completely different from the anime, which is a small thing, but something I really get the tone of in the fights is, Sonji says, I could stain that white rose with your blood in just one strike. The thing about this is when I watched the show, aside from the final fight, I got the impression that nobody would ever actually be hurt because these are all just metaphorical duels. Well, several times throughout the manga, it's very clear that they are fighting with swords, and also it's much more literal, so these people can just all die from a stab wound at any time or get actually hurt. I mean, fencing's generally not the dangerous, not as dangerous, but yeah, you definitely can get stabbed. They aren't wearing protectors or anything like you would in fencing. And one of them's using the sword of Dios. <laughs> Which is like the super strong will delete everything. The goal is to get the flower off of them. But the rules at this point seem like, yeah, you could just stab him in the chest and kill him. You just have to get the rose off. And there's a lot more violent stakes here than you get in the anime, where the worst that happens is instead of a violent stabbing, you'll just get a violent mental breakdown. It's more mental. It's in the head game. But yeah, that staining blood all over the white rose with one strike, it's just, it just sounds way too sexual for to be left unattended. The roses are definitely a metaphor for, okay, fine, the roses are definitely metaphors, there's no way they're just more than one metaphor. All the roses are, at least in the anime, different colors. Is that the case in the manga too? I'm pretty sure. I can't really tell because, you know, we can't actually see the color, but... I can actually check to see if any of the colored printings have... I'm pretty sure the others are different colors, so... Because there's certain pictures that are, like, colored. I'm not seeing any with the dueling roses on them, though, so... After that, we go on and we get a flashback saying, with the prince saying, oh, gender doesn't matter, but... You know, it's the prince. You'll be a prince. It's not a gender, but it's an idea. You know, I mean, it's society that says, oh, princes are male. And the idea of being like a princely figure. Something you have to keep in mind with Utena is when they talk about the prince, they are referring to the archetypal character rather than an actual monarchy. Yeah, they're talking about like the prince that will sweep you off your feet and, you know, save you from harm. The society sees the prince as, like, you know, male the whole time, but, you know, Utena and, like, the prince character definitely sees that as, you know, you don't have to be male specifically, but it's just an idea about kind of characteristics you have to be a good justice and nobility person. In the anime, one of the most important aspects to me about Utena's character is her chasing the ideal of the prince is a childish one because at the start she is the archetypal prince she goes in she swings her swords for anthe and puts herself into danger and she believes that she can solve all of anthe's problems just by going in a fight and being proactive something she never does enough is listen just just listen and be there as a friend knowing that there's not much she can do besides holding a shoulder and being there for her friend in a troubling time. And 
The thing about the ending of Utena is she seems beaten up that she wasn't able to become a prince. But the truth is that's just the start of her becoming an adult, because she becomes a more complex person, who finally is able to just be there for a friend in a way that the prince archetype was just holding her back on. And none of that's mentioned in the manga, and that's a shame. Seonji um, underestimates the fact that, you know, females can be princes and they, they, they can fight, and that's why he loses. And she actually gets the power of the prince, like, shining white on her, because Anthe sees something that she likes about Utena, and it's kind of like, oh, she kind of, in a way, you can kind of tell that she gives her the win. There's definitely evidence, especially in the anime, that Anthe is rigging all these fights. Later on, in the manga, it becomes a bit more clear, but in I, I'd say there's some intuition that you can kind of tell. Now that I think of it, there's definitely different points of the anime and manga where there's evidence of it, and they are largely different points, so it's not like one has one or the other, it's just at different points, it's more clear. Yeah. And at the end of this, Togu like, comes up to her and says, oh, I love you, <laughs> just randomly, and then she's all just confused. She just does not know how to react to that. <laughs> she's like, hmm. Okay then. And then we get a little gag where Auntie says, Oh, I'm your wife now. I'm your possession. And Wakaba's like, No, I'm 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 Utinus. I'm her possession. So it's a weird thing where they're kind of, you know, this whole time we've been saying, Oh, you know, Seonji holding women as possessions as bad, but here we get the women actually trying to be possessions. Two women are fighting over being the possession of a princess, so it's weird. It flips that on its head completely. I don't know if it's just the translation. Wakaba's definitely saying, oh, I, I'm Utena's object or I'm her possession or something like that. And, you know, she wants to be owned by Utena. <laughs> and so does Anthe because she's the, she's the Rose Bride. And that's just how she functions at the moment. The only notes for the next section I have is that Choo Choo is buff. <laughs> Choo Choo is a buff boy. Toga kisses her just out of the blue. Just some classic sexual harassment but. this manga has a weird thing about kissing without having been asked which this sort of thing really depends on the context of the fiction and utana lies in somewhere weirdly in the middle of where toga here is seen as the bad guy later on while here it's ambiguous if it, he is the bad guy for it when he should really just be completely morally mm -hmm. wrong and it's like uh, yeah, you should really make sure this line is drawn, because right now it feels kind of questionable if you're drawing the line or not. And then later, Miki does it, and it's not seen bad at all. And then later, I forgot who else does it, but it's seen as really bad, which in, I think it was Akio, so of course it's really bad. But this manga has a weird point where it's like, sometimes it's really bad, sometimes it's not really bad. Can you please draw a line of the rules of this universe? But yeah, um... We learn that, you know, there are others with letters and the others get rings. But, you know, Utena was the only one who got it ages and ages ago. All these guys just got it a little bit ago. And the sword, it chooses its owner and whoever wins gets Anthe. Anthe's the one with the sword. So it's like, hmm, does Anthe choose who wins? More, more evidence. But yeah, because yeah, Anthe has, Anthe has Dios inside her and the sword chooses its owner. Mm -hmm. um, and it says it harmonizes with the bearer so there's more being gay there and he doesn't love me but he kissed me and there's this whole spat about that how oh yeah Toga totally doesn't care but maybe he does ooh we don't know and then Seonji comes along and smacks Anthe <laughs> and is like go on a date with me <laughs> Which, viewers, is not how you ask women out. You don't ask women out by slapping them in the face, please. <laughs> that is some grade-A dating advice, if I say so myself. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I, I will also say, any woman out there listening to this, or gay men, that is also <laughs> not how you approach men with that no, type of thing. do not approach anyone That's... by slapping them in the face. Ch yes. Maybe if they're a Gundam pilot. Maybe, yeah. Actually, yeah. If they're, uh, if you're in a Gundam anime, you have permission to slap everyone. But not as a dating request. No, you just have permission to slap them because you're in a Gundam episode. 
But this is dating advice, not Gundam advice, so well, there goes that. <laughs> join us next time for Gundam advice. <laughs> and then we get to the party. Well, the dance. Where Utena wears female clothing. Utena wears female clothing. I had a note about the dresses they wear. Yeah, it's definitely a bit more ma- a masculine kind of dress. Where it's got like parts cut off. It's definitely more- Wait, is she wearing the dress that she was given, or is she wearing a different dress? Yes, she is. Um, she is wearing the same dress she's given? I'm pretty sure, yes. But okay. I think Anthe's given another dress by her brother, or, or someone else, I can't remember now. No, they get the- I think they both get the same dress from- So Toga gives both Utana and Anthe dresses, and they're different dresses? Yes. Anthe's dress is... Let me find a picture real fast, sorry. I did it. <laughs> I mean, pra- I practiced a little. <laughs> is it before or after they play baseball? Um... Baseball? <laughs> oh, it's before. I'm pretty sure it's before. Utana and Anthe are both given dresses from Toga. Utana is a bit reluctant to wear the dress, while Anthe's just like, hey, a dress. I'll, I guess I'll wear that. I feel like Utana's dress is a bit more Asian, while Anthe's dress is a bit more European. Mm, maybe? I don't know. I don't know enough about dresses to comment. I'm not a fashion expert, but I feel like the sort of floral pattern gives it more of like, it looks kind of like a skirt mixed with like kimono as a dress, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because I remember in Utena's- I'm probably completely wrong there. Because Utena's got like some of her sleeves aren't a kind of cut off, kind of. Yeah, and she also has like the bow in the back. Yeah, so it's a bit more like reserved, more masculine looking, but it's still like a big ass dress. If it was just a bit more out there, it would almost be like something in a Final Fantasy game. <laughs> I'd play Oots in a Final Fantasy. That'd be cool. I know there's a turn-based JRPG of Sailor Moon that takes place between, like, Sailor Moon S and Supers. Party is cool party. Until Anthe gets slapped, you don't you, you don't slap girls <laughs> to ask them out. You don't slap anybody to ask them out. No. Especially when Utena's around, because Utena will fight Except you. <laughs> she won't, because she doesn't have a sword. Oh no. You know who does have a sword? It's <laughs> it's Toga. Toga and Seonji. They both have swords. Ironically, not wearing a Toga. Hmm. That was a missed fashion opportunity for this fancy dance. Toga it was. and a Toga. He should have worn a Toga. What I find interesting about the fight in the <laughs> the dance fight where Toga and Sayanji just start going at it is Toga gets heavily hurt here, which is something we don't really see in the anime in any of these duels at all aside from the second to last episode. Toga just gets a massive arm injury from Sayanji. He gets stabbed up big time. And the point about it is he, he goes on and says, oh, your dress didn't get stained. That's what's important. It's a big mixed priorities bag kind of deal. Toga says he also viewed Sionji's actions here as against the rules of the duels because he's not going to the traditional uh, castle place to fight. He's just going at it in the middle of a party around people. So Toga just sort of saw he had to stop it because it's against the rules to fight like that. But also it's sort of a tsundere moment of, ooh, does he care about Utena or does he just care about yeah, the rules? It, 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 that's actually developed in the next chapter. <laughs> it's also a thing where you see him sort of perpetuating the systems, but also caring deeply about keeping the systems in place. Because he even brings up his role as the student council president in his argument of if he should get punished or not. So he's like, I have power, let me have word over the system and then the system just says no he gets stabbed and then it really throws a wrench into their relationship it kind of puts a roadblock there but also a giant stab (laughs) wound that that's also put there yeah definitely um what was i gonna say because utana then goes on to say like oh it's my fault he got stabbed she feels really bad about it so she kind of feels more for him so in a way it kind of does more for the relationship, like putting those two together. 
it's also a question of Toga sort of seen as somewhat of a justice yes. figure. I've been going on with this. So him trying to serve justice, which is, it's not often drawn in a distinction in Uchina, but here I feel nobility and justice are completely drawn a line between, where Toga here is just pure justice, not focusing on nobility as much. Because they're both components of the princely character, but he doesn't encompass that totally. And then we get that expanded idea of, oh, is he doing it out of justice? Or is it, you know, he just uwu sundere with Utena? Because Juri has a kind of thing for Toga. So he's yeah, in, in, the manga, in the manga. To be in the manga, specific. Yes. In the anime, she has a... She has a gay. <laughs> she has a probably gay, which is like a 99% chance of being yes. a gay. But she's not in the manga. <laughs> that we know of. But yeah, in the manga, she's, she's pretty straight. Um... She thinks Toga's, you know, doing it out of the duty to the duel, not out of love. And Mickey says, he's a man. He he, he doing it because he loves her or he likes her. And there's these two arguing about it. And Juri feels kind of bad about it because she really heavily suspects that he might actually be doing it out of love. But she's kind of denying it. And yeah, Juri actually slaps Utena saying, oh, yeah, don't be so uppity. He doesn't actually love you. At least uh, she's not trying to flirt with Utena. Well, <laughs> this is true. Does she get flirty in the anime? It's a, it's a step above other uh, characters in here. Because yeah, everyone flirts with Utena except except for Juri and Sayonji. But yeah, I was referring to Sayonji trying to flirt with Anthony by slapping her. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. That 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 took me a second to get, but yes, Juri was slapping her because. She hated her, not because she was asking her out. Okay, I've explained the joke too much. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and then they fight. Because I think she directly asks Toga, and she's like, actually, no, I can't exactly remember why. But Juri finds out she's pretty s sure about it. And Sayonji knows for sure, like, oh, yeah, he's totally into her. But Juri's just like, nope, 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 nope. This oh, yeah, this is the part where they're discussing his punishment. This is the part where he's like, oh, I'm very adamant about not taking punishment. But then as as soon as he gets this little jab off at Juri saying, oh, he doesn't love you. He loves Utena. He leaves and takes the punishment. So it's like reinforcing this idea that he just wants to see people hurt. He's just in it for the kick, kind of. He still got that mentality at the moment, at least. He would definitely be an edgy memer. He is. He's a very edgy memer. Um... He just ha wants to get that effect off. He, do he doesn't care about whatever happens to him. He just wants to make people hurt. I don't know if we passed it, but if you're reading the Viz hardcovers, uh, Choo Choo dabs at page 173. I promote dabbing very hard. I am dabbing right now, but you won't be able to tell. So after that whole thing goes down, do you have anything to cover with the fight? Um, There's this part where they go with, oh, why would a woman want Anthe as well? where Sayanji goes. In the fight with Juri and Utena. Yeah, I think this is a bit before. It's leading up to it. i have even not even sure what this refers to exactly. I've just got this written down in my notes. She's, why is Juri fighting me? She doesn't want a woman. She's, she's, she's heterosexual. She doesn't want Anthe. But yeah. But she says two, as in she is already into her a bit. It kind of leads into that, but not very hard at the moment. Because it's saying she definitely wants to protect Anthe. And also, yeah, just... This is the first time we get a really good look at the city and at, at night and it's just a really pretty s scene. And Toga goes on a line where it's to protect a princess, a knight is ready to sacrifice his life. Saying like Toga's kind of the knight character and he's not actually the prince. It's more hinty hints. And Utena goes, I don't want to be protected. I want to be the prince, which we've already covered a lot, really. And I'm kind of just repeating what we've already said. Yeah, um, there's also this cool thing where it says... The roses of the castle, it's like, all because everyone's got like the rose, um, the ring. So, you know, everyone kind of belongs in the castle of like the idealized version of themselves, the kind of perfect version of themselves where they, they can revolutionize the world. Like they all have a chance at it, but they kind of don't. And then the fight starts happening. If you want to get to that. Stabby stab. Yeah, stabby stab. And she's like. Wait, sorry, is this the jury fight? Yeah, the jury fight. Yeah, she kind of just, oh, I'm a professional fencer. I would never leave a hole in my defense. And then she leaves a hole in her defense. Blast. Foiled again. Yeah. I feel like there's more to say in the anime because 
I specifically remember this fight in the anime where it's like, oh, Jiri's like, luck can never happen. And then she wins out of luck of a soul falling out of the sky. Which was probably actually not luck, ironically, because Anthe is rigging everything. Yeah, exactly. It's like there to make a point. Like, oh, you thought it would never happen, but it did. Whoa. And in the anime, it's just, oh, you left a hole in your defense because you were, you know. I think you got this mixed up. Yeah. If only she downbeat to counter. Quit putting all these anime sword fighters into Utena. <laughs> She kind of just loses just because she's sad about Toga being into Utena and not her. So she's like, oh, she's kind of depressed. And they even go after that. Like, Utena and Antigua are like, oh, Juri's kind of depressed. Let's go see Toga. <laughs> they completely just ignore her. They just don't care. Um, and they find uh, Toga's secret cupboard with constellations and predictions of everything that's going to happen. Even though, like, only a few more fights are going to be predicted. But yeah. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but did your version have the birthdays of the other characters? There's some kooky stuff about like, oh, someone's born like at December 31st and someone's like the 1st of December and Anthe's like the 29th of February, which doesn't exist. So it's like, there's a bunch of really interesting constellation signs. I'm sure that could be like, you know, analyzed further into, but A, I haven't researched it and two, probably not as interesting, so... We're going to go past that. But yeah, he basically just says, oh, yes, everything's predicted. Mickey, you're going to fight Utena, and whether you like it or not, because you're going to have a reason for it. Toga actually gets Mickey up against the wall. You know those, like, poses where yeah, yeah. the girl's pushed up against the wall by the dude? He's got the one hand on the wall, but he does it to the guy. So it's a weird role reversal, but not even reversal, but... I don't know. I've never seen a guy do it to a guy before. It's definitely with I feel like uh, a guy doing it to a girl or a girl doing it to a girl is uh, fairly common, but I haven't seen much in terms of guy, guy. And then he goes on the thing where it's like, oh, Mickey, you're trying to defend Utena, but, you know, she can defend herself. And then, strangely, Toga has a Wizard of Oz shirt on. I don't know if you picked that up, but for some reason. He's got a Wizard of Oz shirt, which is strangely relevant because, like, Wizard of Oz is a very, oh, you had, you know, you had courage in you the whole time. You had brains. You had a heart in you the whole time. You just needed, you know, someone to bring it out of you. So it's like, it's a relevant story. I have never considered the Wizard of Oz as being paralleled to Revolutionary Girl Utena. Yeah, it it made me think about it for a minute, but it, it is relevant to it. Yeah, maybe maybe there could be more parallels, but <laughs> as I said, we don't want to linger too for much on this. And that's all really for that part. It was saying, oh, you'll fight and you'll be forced to do it. And Mika's like, no, I won't. Yes, he will. <laughs> no, I won't. I'm not touching you. <laughs> <laughs> and then we cut to Kozoe, which is his sister. <laughs> and she jumps him just like... Wakaba Something is I Utena. kind of have an issue with the manga, and not so much the anime, is the sort of sibling stuff that goes on between them is portrayed as not so serious, whereas the anime makes it clear this is not okay with any time there's siblings like that. <laughs> yeah, this one's just kind of played straight. It's like, yeah... She's kind of just obsessed. We don't know really about Mickey's feelings, but... Which Mickey's feelings in the manga are very different from the anime. Yeah, we know he yeah. cares about her like as a sister, but we don't really get any more than that. I'm not sure if it's just no, no, like, no romantic feelings or it's just left blank, left vague. We do know that he does have a crush on Utena in this version, which is a weird reversal of the anime. And completely changes his entire outlook on the situation. Yeah, because he doesn't want to fight Utena. Because he's like, oh, you know. In the anime, he just sort of assumes that Anthe wants to be with him. And then... <laughs> Which is really weird. I feel like it's done a bit more better than I described it there. But it's more of him just sort of having a, a miscommunicated idea that ends up being false and he realizes his mistake. Whereas the manga, he just has a crush on Utena and he doesn't really have a lesson to be learned. 
Miki in the anime definitely feels like someone who is also trying to be a prince, but he assumes just too much about the world rather than sitting and actually listening, which is something Utana also has a problem with. He thinks he knows that. And it's sort of a early parallel to how Utana will be and what she has to grow beyond. She definitely isn't as bad as Miki in that aspect, but it's definitely still there and it's something she needs to learn to change about herself. Also, like, a uh, one thing I picked up is that this is just from coming from watching the show before, but, like, all the characters have a bit of Arkyo in them. Like, especially here, I picked up, all oh, the thing was the sister and, you know, the toga of the manipulating people and the Seonji, you know, just using people as tools. It's just everyone has a bit of Arkyo in them. Everyone has a little bit of Xehanort in them. Everyone has a little bit of Arkyo in them. <laughs> It's the, ooh, dark side, light side, ooh, spooky. The villain, you can see a little bit of yourself in said villain. The characters can see a little bit of themselves in said villain, where sort of all their native traits sort of coalesce into the main villain. Yeah, that works. I think that's a good way of describing it. It's like, it's all the negative traits put into one character in some massive... Symbolic evil. Goes away, loves her brother. <laughs> she makes fun of Utena for having bad grades, and then it backfires because Mickey then spends time with her, fi- helping her fix her grades, and then Mickey kisses her while she's sleeping. <laughs> don't 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 kiss people while they're sleeping either. That's that's not a good plan. That is that is a bad idea. It's also kind of weird how. The manga just completely glosses over that. Yeah, it, it's it's this weird thing of he's trying to be Toga, where he just casually kisses her, but he's too much of a innocent boy t- to pull it off confidently. He just, he does it, but he's like ashamed of it. He knows he shouldn't have done it. The kiss is weird because it doesn't show Miki as being nearly as bad as the other two kisses as we see, kind of like that. Which, both of those don't feel like they put enough emphasis on. Yeah, you should probably ask first, but especially Miki doing it while she is asleep (laughs) is very red flags. And the fact that the story treats him as the most innocent of these three when she was asleep is definitely something I find a little bit questionable. Yeah, a lot of things <laughs> have been questionable. Uh, don't kiss people while they're sleeping. That is a good thing to do. <laughs> Rules to live by. When Ko's away, his sister accuses Utena of being male-like, while her brother is like more feminine, is like a feminine dude, and Utena is more, like, kind of like a masculine girl. So it's like, oh, you kind of fit for him, but I don't, and I don't like you from that for that, and... Mickey gets angry and hits his sister. And then Utena's like, oh, it's not like you to hit your sister. You're not kind of masculine. You don't hit your sister. You're not mean, dude. You wouldn't do things against females' will, like kissing them in your sleep. (laughs) And then a reason is contrived to have Mickey fight Utena for his sister. It's a bit weird how it comes together. They just sort of kidnap his sister. And it's like, if you don't fight, we'll uh, we'll keep her. And it's made to seem like Toga's doing it, but for some reason it was Anthe because secret plot hook that comes in later. It's really forced because I don't want to fight you, I don't want to fight you, but uh, kidnap. Yeah. It's incredibly forced. If only there was some sort of way to have Miki have a character arc where he would actively want to fight Utena and then learn a lesson through his fight as a metaphor for his character growth. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine. Imagine, May. That would never happen. May. One thing I feel yeah. the manga did much worse, if it was obvious by now, is Miki is much better in the anime, personally. The fight's not even really interesting. There's not much to say about it. It kind of comes off as like, oh, Anthe set it up and all, but it was kind of for Kozue, her sister, to see that, oh, your brother does care about you, but it's just never expanded upon ever again. It's like, oh, yeah. Your brother loves you. Especially because she is much less of a character in the manga. Yeah, she just exists here and never again. Which is more than she already got. <laughs> True. But also, um, I was going to touch on that. Oh, it's kind of an Anthe thing where maybe Anthe wishes her brother loved her. 
Oh no. But yeah, I, I definitely see the parallel there. That was something like, oh, your brother does care about you. It's an important thing for you to realize because my brother doesn't love me. Anthe deserves head pats. He does. Anthe deserves the whole world. As opposed to the world's end. Yes, as opposed to the world's end. And yeah, that's really all I have to say on that part. Anthe's making curry for the girlfriend, for the wife. Manga actually says she adds in vegetables, but there's pictures of fruit in the manga. <laughs> so already warning flags are going up. And Choo Choo, upon this, he adds some spice to try to hide the bad flavor. And then the house explodes. Really trying to spice up their relationship? It is. It's a very spicy relationship. Um, yeah, and, and the house explodes. E- everything explodes. And then they swap bodies, and then uh, they swap... We get some to swap back, and it will never be mentioned again. Except I'm going to mention it more now. <laughs> yeah, just slightly. Um, The council members think they've been bombed. Anthe and Utena are swapped. So Anthony, An- I said Anthony, <laughs> Anthe, she, she slaps people. Um, and U- It's about time. And Utena is a cute maid. And you can you can actually tell who they are very easily because Anthe always calls Utena Utena Summer. And it's like, oh. Utena wouldn't use this language. It's an anti thing. But yeah, that's about it, really. And that is the end of Revolution 1. And I go on to my second book of the box set. <laughs> okay, um, we've transformed to the second volume part. Uh, Utena goes to confront Toga because, you know, he may be her prince. And that's what she's been thinking this whole time because there's been evidence. And he says, oh, yeah. I totally am. Toga looks nothing like the prince, but he says, oh, space time. It's a thing with the sword of Dio, so I can look however I want. And you are now growing into my ideal woman. Dun dun dun. It's, it's growing people to become perfect slaves, kind of, but not really, because also Anthe has no soul. Also, let's bring that on you. Anthe has no free will. She does whatever you request. Yeah, and also a fu- really funny thing to see is that Wakaba reacts the exact same way Anthe does, even though she's not a rose bride or anything. She's just like, oh, if Utena wants that, I'll do it. Anthe's going to react the exact same way. Yeah. So it's weird that like, oh, being a possession is it's, it's what, it's what I said before. It's like, oh, being possession's bad, but well, we actually kind of want to do that. We actually kind of want to be dedicated to this one person. That's it. Akio meets up with Utena. Akio is... Assumed to be at least 18, Utena's 14, big red flags, the prince is a lie. So, something I want to bring up is, there's a point where Akio starts flirting with Utena and starts describing himself as the devil and Lucifer and all that. Uh, Something to note about this panel is the symbolism used on Akio's chest. A lot of people would just assume it's a serpent in Christianity. Christianity religion because general he's calling himself both the devil and Lucifer but the interesting thing here is the double snake motif and the ball seems to be more of an Abraxas thing and Akio and Dios especially in the manga less so in the anime are super Abraxas metaphor which we'll go more into later (laughs) also one thing I want to add that he goes saying oh yeah I protect my sister from the bad people but he actually is not doing that at all. Utena, U- he is the bad. He people. is the bad people. Utena is the one who has to protect. Before Utena was trying to get her to have new friends, and Akio is now saying, "Oh, you should make friends like Utena." And then you can vis- visibly see Anthe making a bigger effort, which is the point, which is important. You definitely do see that Akio is supposed to be the highest point in the society, so he has by far the most power, which even breaks the rules we've seen before about how Anthe's whole Rose Bride stuff works. Yeah, he just has the most influence over her, which is strange. Not just her, but over the entire setting, which is why it's so surprising when he has the most power over her, because before this point, we've always assumed it was just the winner of the duels who did. So the entire, like, ending section of the manga is entirely different from the anime. So I think I'm just going to talk a bit about how Dios and 
Dios and Akio's relationship in the manga is very different from what it is in the anime, because in the manga, Dios and Akio end up being two sides of the same person. And if you've ever read Homestuck, it's almost like a cherub type of thing, of where it's two personalities fighting each other, one good and one bad. Also in Dragon Ball. (laughs) And this sort of good, bad, and the same body sort of clashing. Again, Akio just is a Braxis, or at least that's what it's sort of going for before Akio ends up killing Dios. And then Dios with Utena kills Akio. So you sort of have these both paradoxes in the same person. And even more, not just Abraxas, but Dimian, the book in general, which had a bit of inspiration on Utena. A lot of the points where Akio is just sort of hanging out with Utena and just telling her all this knowledge that the normal people aren't going to tell you about life and philosophy gives me very similar vibes to, well, not very similar because it's not nearly as creepy because these two characters are the same age and, you know, Akio is a creep, but Akio kind of reminds me of Demian and Utena in these situations remind me of Emil Sinclair because Demian would tell Emil all these philosophies that would go against mainstream thought at the time. So having some of the same ideas from Akio tells Utena literally almost a direct quote from Demian which is the whole quote about the eggshell and going into the other world. That's all from Demian. And that sort of character dynamic there before it starts being even more creepy, the non-romantic parts are also sort of a Demian type of thing. (laughs) So now that we sort of have Akio out of the way, do you have anything to add about Akio being a split personality instead of, say, not? Really, it's kind of just... Because we don't get to know anything about Dios until the very end. Well, I do appreciate the Demian and Abraxas stuff in here, especially after listening to that four-hour audiobook. I much prefer how the anime handled this backstory of him just being someone who was so burnt out that he just stopped caring about others after completely being a martyr and trying to do everything for others, which just killed him, and slowly becoming this horrible, cynical, and jaded person. Yeah. Whereas here it just literally is Caliborn and Calliope and Homestuck. Yeah, it's a lot more interesting though. I'm pretty sure are also based on Abraxas, so who knows? Yeah, here it's just, oh, good, evil, whoa, they, they, they do fight. They fought, they were angry at each other. I mean, I guess you got that Cain and Abel thing going on, where it's, oh, the good one was more good, so the bad one hated him. Is it the bad one's fault that it happened? I don't know. Bad. It's interesting that you bring it up because one of the earliest conversations in Demian, when Demian's talking to the main character, is he explains for the first time about how Cain and Abel, maybe the big guy wasn't in the wrong. And then Emil's just like, whoa, that wasn't very Christian of you. <laughs> Tell me more. Yeah basically. Yeah, it does seem a very Cain and Abel thing. The manga is a bit more satisfying in not the best way, because you really see Utena idealized as the prince. If you haven't seen the anime, then this will be a really good feeling moment, because she finally is the prince, and she triumphs over over the bad guy, you know. Except for, if you watch the anime first, especially if you really know the anime well, which I would probably be more disappointed in this manga if I did rewatch it recently. The thing about Utena being that ultimate prince is the anime really gets into the question of why does she want to be the prince, and if that's really the healthiest option. So while it's a good popcorn moment, I'm not sure if it was the best in terms of generally, is this what the character really needs in life, or does she need something more? And while on the surface as a standalone manga, I feel that way, if I look at it at the start of the revolution of her being a prince, and then the anime happens where she slowly starts to question the ideals of the prince, and eventually taking these lessons and using it in adolescence to help free both her and Anthe from Atoria Academy, it's a much more satisfying character loop. Kaido was right all along. Kaido was right. The prince is a lie. Don't listen to the prince. No, actually, one thing I do have to add is that, like, at the start, Udna is kind of turned into the Rose Bride, like, where Akio controls her every move. So, like, she before she does 
eventually become the prince. She's turned into like, oh, the ultimate feminine figure, Anthe, you know, being controlled with, a, oh, yes, you have no will of your own. You get to do nothing at all while I get to reign free and do whatever. Are you talking about when he does the ritual? Yeah, the ritual. That was interesting because when he described it, what I thought you were talking about is how the Rose Bride follows the commands yeah. of Akio. Yeah. But also because the Rose Bride is rigging the duels, Utana herself is a ro- is her own Rose Bride without realizing yes. it. Yes. Because in trying to do her own actions, Anthe is rigging all the duels, making her Akio's own pawn, making her follow all the commands of Akio without even realizing it. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting at, but it's like... I, I jumped ahead then. <laughs> nah, it's all good. You actually probably explained it better than I would. Udena is just in this position where she just has no power over herself, and it's kind of disheartening to see where someone who had like, all this power and all this hope before is just returned to nothing. And, like, even Toga scorns her a bit before that, where it's like, oh, you know this is bad, why are you still doing it? And it's like, and Utsun's like, I have to, you know, this is how I feel, even though I know it's wrong, which is kind of a sad moment. Yeah, I don't really know how to expand on that. I don't either, that was a good point, though. Take my revolution, da 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 The rest of this podcast will just be us singing. Zahi Koku. <laughs> no day, she no tease it. At the end, we sort of see how everyone's starting to forget Utana. However, in a lot of the. In the anime, it's interesting because Anthe is the only one who remembers Utana's existence. Well, here we actually see Toga holds on to her memory longer than he seems to in other versions, or at least compared to everyone else. Because he doesn't get frozen when he goes into the castle. Is that because I got the... I felt like the entire sort of uh, campus student, everybody, sort of just forgot about her after that. I feel like the change happened in the castle and whoever was active in the castle got changed. Toga, how he acts in the manga definitely does play a bigger role into how he acts in the adolescence of Utena manga, which I haven't read. Yeah, we need to get onto that someday, but... I, I haven't considered that angle, though, that uh, Toga remembered because he wasn't in one of the uh, the coffins. And the coffins were, like, reasons why, like, the characters were still not, like, true to themselves or not doing all that they were fearful of what was happening. <laughs> I have way better ways to explain this, but... I'm not even sure the point of the coffins, aside from getting these characters out of the way. I think there was. There was like Because it felt like they had a bigger meaning of, you go in these coffins because of this unresolved character thing. Except for it also feels like everyone who's not in a coffin that didn't get put in a coffin should be in the coffin by that logic. So it just sort of felt like Anthe being like, you don't matter in this final conflict. Yeah. I'm just going to put you in a coffin. It, does, it really does. But there is a little bit to it, but I'm happy to give it the benefit of the doubt. A bit of it is, yeah, kind of just you go away because you're not important. The also one thing I don't think we've touched on is that a bit earlier when Anthe starts like falling in love with Utena, that when she's talking with Akio, he's just going on like, yes, I can't have her, but I will destroy her, you know? But and then oh Utena will be hurt and then Anthe's gonna blush and she's kind of you know sad about it actually I kind of went on like three notes in a row and they were all like from different parts but it's fine <laughs> this is kind of a mess April Fools yeah. there's this part where Utena's asking if Anthe will be hurt if Utena's loved ones are hurt and then Utena Anthe's like oh I'm you love me kind of and then an uwu moment (laughs) he's just gone i've just gone off track now yeah i definitely felt the most of their relationship was at the final chapter bits i got the impression that utana just barely realized she had any romantic feelings for anthe before the final attack and it was just sort of a final shock before she really considered what she was about to do there was a bit of development but not a lot the thing about the Utena manga is at the end, there's like two more side arcs that sort of take place in the middle of the manga, but I think were written after the manga finished. They definitely take ideas that were probably already in the anime at this point, because the anime finished before the manga finished. So it definitely was already... 
this takes ideas from the anime that wasn't in the manga because you don't really get any of the Black Rose stuff and there's several arcs that are just not in the manga that are in the anime. The first one of these is basically everything with Ryuka, which is a uh, jury's fencing teacher or something like that. Previous fencing uh, team president. I don't have much to say here, except for Ruka is made a lot more sympathetic than the anime, where he's just super manipulated. Where Ruka is just super manipulative in the anime, he is very sympathetic in the manga. But also... Uh, once again, Shiori is nowhere to be seen, and this just gives Jury complete double heterosexuality over a guy who in the anime Meanwhile in Meanwhile in the anime it's heavily implied that any feelings she showed toward this guy was just to make her female crush embarrassed and jealous of her. So it's like this is the exact opposite role of how their relationship was in the manga and anime. <laughs> now, this is the one interesting point of um, Juri loses all her pride. And, like, it's made mention that, you know, she's really hurt. And, you know, with Utsuna, the pride and the justice and stuff, that's th that's really important to a character. But when she loses it, you know, she's all down and depressed and she won't even find anyone. Yeah, uh, we have the Black Rose plot. Not to be confused with the Black Rose Duelist, which Yu-Gi-Oh! 5D's funny joke, ha ha. The Black Rose side plot is very weird because it almost immediately you're told that all the duelists were killed in a fire, which is like the major plot twist in the final part of the Black Rose arc in the anime. <laughs> you have the two guys in the Black Rose arc who, this is Utena, but surprisingly this is by far the most gay part of the the manga. Like, they're not confirmed to be a thing, but it's much heavily more implied than the other options you have in the manga. So now that we're done with all of our notes uh, specifics, I just want to talk about the structure a little bit, because in the anime it's almost like a not monster of the week, but you sort of have a sword fight every week, and it's sort of you're focusing on you're focusing on this character this week, and then it changes every week before you eventually reach sort of the final arc with Akio at the end. Whereas in the the manga, you have much straight line towards the finish of just a tournament duel, and then you get to Akio instead of just sort of this revolution cycle. Yeah, because even in the anime, you kind of did it twice, yeah. like once with the normal roses. Three times. Yeah, three times. Once with the normal roses, once with the black rose, and then kind of again. This fits more thematically with the story it's trying to tell, but I think it also kind of makes it less entertaining to watch if you're binge-watching the Utena anime. Well, it makes the Utena manga a bit more to read in one, well, a couple of sittings, but in long stretches. I also think this helps because uh, I think this also plays a role in sort of the more linear nature of the manga, while the anime is very metaphorical and much less grounded. A very different type of tone of story, which, to be fair, some people probably will just prefer the manga's tone in general because it's much less metaphorical and some people just can't get into heavily metaphorical, not literal, you know what I mean. Revolutionary Girl Utena is... Uh... It's good. It's not as uh, mind blowing as the anime, though. Yeah. What? What? Do both. Yeah, it's, it's a fun read. Yeah, definitely yeah. read. It's it's interesting. Like if you can only do one, you should probably do the anime for the most. Uh, you'll be cultured, and your mind will be expanded. <laughs> and you know, Kaneko Ikuhara. I keep print. I think I keep printing that. Ikuhara is a masterful director. He knows what he's doing. He's good. And uh, I haven't read any of... I just haven't read any of Chiho Saito's other stuff, so I can't say anything about her besides uh, Utena is a manga that exists. Definitely worth a look because it's interesting. And it's nice. Next time on the Pokemongos podcast, we're going to actually talk about Pokemon again. People are commenting, asking where's part two. It's coming. This is part two. Soon. This is what you get. Oh. <laughs> uh, normal podcast next time, whenever that is.